right, so we are back and we are with Lotum today and a very black and white looking Eddie Doyle and we don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so everybody who's probably going to be watching this in the archive for the most part, because we still haven't advertised these yet, uh, we will once we big up some momentum, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Eddie Doyle from Checkpoint. Um, I'm a security strategist, keynote speaker, uh, evangelist of all things Checkpoint, not just our products, our brilliant company, our people. Talking of people, we have Lotum. Lotum, you are joining us today from our head office in Tel Aviv. How are you, man? Great. Thank you for hosting me, uh, Andy. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, um, there's a couple of things that I got busted right out the gate because I'm black and white and I don't know why. About five, I was doing this all morning. Everything was working fine. I got on with Lotum and then all of a sudden, look at me now. <laughs> okay, well, I'll deal with that for the next show. But I'm also going to bust Lotum because one of the beautiful things that, and, I, and this is true, I actually evangelize this about my company is the people. So we have, what time is it there for you, buddy? It's uh, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And you've got a six month old daughter. Is that six months, right. is she? Sleeping, right. sleeping just to your left. And Lotum is talking to us set up from the balcony <laughs> so that he can get privacy to speak to our customers and anyone else that is interested in understanding cybersecurity to keep our world safe online. So that's the beauty of humans working at this company. And Lotum, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being on your balcony. Please, it's not raining. <laughs> yeah, securing my bedtime, my daughter' bedtime is uh, also important. Like securing. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You've got to run. You, well, that's this is what we need today, right? You've got to be super yeah. dad, super employee, super husband, super everything. High demands, yeah. and for people listening, it's you know super security guys. Let's keep everybody safe. A lot is expected of us, and so this is a new series that I would like to start. Checkpoint came out with a security report. So I'm gonna give the layup, Lotum, and then you're gonna jump in because I purposefully just breezed this report. I didn't wanna look through it, right, and understand it from the beginning because I wanna go on a journey with the people listening to the, the series of, um, of uh, live streams so that we can learn together. So it's my understanding that we put it, well, we put a report together every year. We start the report around October, November, and we work hard at it, and we release this report hopefully in the first week or two of January. Is that about accurate, Lotum? Right. And Lotum is the director and leader of our threat intelligence and research department. So you will see on the bottom of this report here, if I can do weatherman, you've got um, checkpoints, uh, CPR, checkpoint research. And so we have how many people in checkpoint research now? Two, three hundred maybe? Yeah, about uh, 250, yeah. I Okay, I describe these people as follows, and I want you to tell me if you think my description is accurate. So all of your colleagues in this threat research and this checkpoint research department, the way I look at them is offensive cyber operators. Right, That's a nice Ooh. way of sort of saying white hat hackers, right? Offensive cyber operators. So we purposefully invested in several hundred people, giving them all the tools they needed to go online and obviously into the dark and deep web every single day, assume a persona, an avatar of, you know, a criminal or terrorist, whatever, a person, and essentially just take a look around. What are criminals selling? What are they trying to steal? What sells for a lot of money? How are they doing it? This is how I describe CPR. What do you think, man? I think this is quite accurate. Um, and topping on that, that we actually have uh, a unique uh, opportunity to sense hundreds of thousands of uh, networks, companies, uh, endpoints, uh, mobile devices, cloud environments. Uh, so we have vast amount of data uh, to try and um, put an image of the threat landscape that I think nobody uh, has something uh, even closer to that. Um, so with vast amount of data, we can tell what is on the rise and what is actually uh, losing uh, popularity among threat actors, uh, what they are interested in, uh, and also even uh, what uh, technologies do they adapt uh, and uh, adjust their tools and, um, and weapons uh, towards. Uh, so, for example, whether it is cloud or mobile, um, they are there and they are, uh, they are always um, looking for emerging technologies and we need to see uh, what is the level of understanding of these technologies 
and how can they actually uh, exploit them. Right. So, so do you have any real world examples that you can use of when we perhaps engaged with um, threat actors on the dark web and we learned, oh, that's interesting, like a recent example, that's new, that's going, how are they going to develop that into a weapon? Is this, is this, give me, give me some examples of things we would discuss. Sure. Uh, sure. Um, let's say, for example, Discord. Uh, we, youth and uh, youngsters are uh, uh, very active on Discord, and especially in the field of gaming. Um, but we understand that threat actors, uh, previously gamers, uh, uh, for example, uh, found Discord a very uh, useful uh, channel to uh, communicate through and even use uh, for to leverage attacks to communicate with, com with command control servers. They don't have to set uh, a whole new infrastructure of servers, but they can uh, simply set up a, a Discord channel. Um, and we are there, uh, for example, and we just heard about uh, threat actors that are using it. Uh, Microsoft reported it, uh, and we were there uh, for many months now, and we even reported about uh, the possibility of threat actors of using this Discord. It was, I think, two months before uh, we uh, before Microsoft told everyone that uh, threat actors are using uh, Discord. Um, yeah, you are looking for something. What is well, that's what right, is because it's like, who owns Discord then? Uh, ooh. Uh, that's interesting. So I think it is distributed. Yeah, the concept of Discord started with these guys, right? Uh, founded Open Faint, okay, social gaming platform, blah, blah, blah. So it's still privately held, really? That's interesting, Lodum. I'd never thought of that one. So threat actors are actually using, okay, so for people who don't know, and I've only just started using Discord myself because I found it really useful for a little techie problem I was having, a personal techie problem. And people on the, on the, on the Discord channel for this actually OBS studio that's showing you and me in black and white right now, I clearly have more challenges to go back onto Discord for them. And so I went onto Discord, I went to the OBS channel, found an answer, it was great. My understanding of Discord then is that you, cre you, can, you can set up a virtual server and then you can just put anything on it. You can communicate on it. So you're telling me now that threat actors are setting up virtual servers to use as attacks. Yeah, why, yeah. why, why do they have to bother with all the configurations and even connecting it and associating with IP address and everything? They have Discord, they have this uh, technology to use and they are seeking for new technologies. They are levering technologies that they are familiar with. Uh, and they're actually weaponizing them in a way. Mm. Uh, it was with every, actually, every technology. Now we, we accept that there are uh, many uh, malicious servers hosted on uh, public uh, or on uh, um, popular cloud environments like AWS or Azure. Uh, but uh, now it's, it's like common uh, uh, practice. Uh, and not long ago, it was very new to us. Uh, like... The technology was new to uh, to us as companies, um, right. threat actors leverage uh, uh, such technologies. Um, but this is not the, the only example, actually. I can also share with you without getting into names because we are we also need to secure our sources. But it is very it's, it's a, a yet another a common practice that when uh, advanced threat actor or a nation state. Uh, wishes to detach themselves from a specific attack because it, 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 the, the target is or the subject is not that legit, uh, for example, uh, public, uh, or international event or something like that. They want to detach themselves, not to be connected or associated with the attack, although they want to carry it. So what they do, they use proxy organizations. They use all kinds of freelancers uh, uh, to do that. Um, and just recently we talked with one uh, that was willing to work with one country, but also for, this, for uh, the right uh, amount of money for uh, enemy of this country, for, uh, um, for other country as well. So we learned about, a lot about their tactics. We learned a, a lot about uh, actually um, the fingerprints of uh, this nation state in uh, their cyber attacks and now we have a better ability to actually detect and block uh, such attacks uh, in the wild and this kind of sources even human sources uh, assist us in 
uh, providing better security, uh, actually day by day. That is so powerful. And it's my understanding that we're the only company, as far as a, a major cybersecurity provider that's in the magic quadrant, that is really dedicating the resources on that. But I, I want to understand that story a little bit better. So, so are you saying that your team went into the dark web? They befriended a criminal, or not befriended, they engaged with a criminal organization. And this organization was using, what were the proxies for the servers to launch attacks? Like, a, can you tell the story without divulging anything that you need to not? Yeah, that? so it, it, is an, it, is an, it, it is even uh, a, a crazier story. Uh, what was actually is that we uh, discovered a malicious command control server uh, and when we try to understand what is the function of this server and what is the nature actually of this server, uh, we had to examine its communication to see uh, who is targeting um, victims with this server uh, all around the world. And what we had is that while investigating uh, the server, uh, we were left with um, a message from the server owner that if you want to contact to to get in contact, uh, please go to uh, this secret chat and we had to uh, communicate uh, with the owner of the server uh, who found to be a freelancer that works for a foreign country um, and actually carrying out attacks on their behalf uh, and is willing to get more jobs uh, for a certain amount of money um, oh, no, and he really? couldn't care less about the identity of uh, of the the ones who are talking with them with him. man so what so what you're saying is okay let me see if i can summarize it what you're saying is you th there's a country that needs to use that, that wants to launch attacks but they want to have their hands clean of it right so what they do is they get a cybercrime syndicate an individual or a group of people and you, you go do this thing they're probably paying them on some kind of back channel but that person wants more money, so they advertise their services on the dark web. And what kind of attacks are they launching? DDoS, ransomware, what are they doing? So actually it was uh, intellectual property theft oh. um, and sabotage as well. So they tried to sabotage some operation. Uh, of, How? Uh, How do they do so, so actually they uh, temper data uh, and also um, actually wipe the servers that they uh, worked uh, on. So after in, after stealing the information and tempering the data, they actually wiped the entire server. So nobody would ever uh, be able to uh, tell what was happening on the server afterwards. So um, when, when, and when they tamper the data, what do they typically do? How do they tamper it? Do you mean just change it to trick the company into falling over? Yeah, so for example, any access log is now deleted or changed um, and every, uh, every uh, documentation of uh, users that were uh, actually part of the service that the, the company um, um, actually served um, is, uh, is obviously uh, um, changed just, because, just to remove uh, traces uh, of activity, of past activity of the group. Um, so it was very uh, interesting to see um, their, um, their tools um, and the tactics and the fact that they were actually using someone who was who, who by uh, the, the right amount of money could actually attack them as well, uh, if you wish. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a saying in English, there's no honor among thieves. Right. 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 <laughs> so let's so, take, for example, I, I can take you to another example. OK, so just to, to stress the fact that uh, yeah. threat actors are using or nation state actors are using proxies um, to uh, distance themselves from um, a specific attack. Um, we have now the uh, the Winter Olympic Games in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in China, in Beijing. Right. Um, so. Can you tell what were the the previous uh, Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games uh, took place? Uh, where was the, oh, Sochi in Russia, wasn't it? Was it Sochi? Sochi? It's a yeah, great it's so answer. Every time it works, actually, every time. But the previous ones weren't in uh, in Russia and uh, Sochi, but ah. in in South Korea, and in and it is very interesting uh, 
to see that you also answered Sochi, and maybe the, the next thing would uh, give you a sense of the impact of cyber attacks, and maybe it also changes, uh, it is able to change uh, the, the international memory uh, of uh, such an important event. So it was, um, I think, 2018, um, and the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games took place in, in South Korea. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it was about four years ago. Okay. Um, and a few days into the games, um, there was a major attack on the servers of the Winter, the Winter Olympic Games Committee. Um, a so powerful attack that actually wiped the uh, important data out of the servers. Uh, it was in South Korea. What was the, the exact date? No kidding. So, oh, yeah. Pyeongchang, 2018, right? Sochi was right. 14, Eight. Vancouver was 10, right. right? Yeah. Okay, buddy. This is a great story. Go on. So, a few days into the into the games, um, there was a major attack that uh, was actually dubbed uh, Olympic Destroyer. And what they did in the attack, they wiped servers of the Olympic Committee. Um, and when Threat actors are using Wiper that actually wipes the entire data. Um, we obviously see that there is no uh, financial incentive in the attack. And when there is no financial incentive in the attack and it is purely sabotage, obviously the cyber crime op uh, option is removed from the table and we are left with a uh, nation state attack. And, and with uh, a nation state attack, and when the victim is in South Korea, the immediate suspect is obviously. South China. Korea, the immediate suspect? Yeah. North, Korea. North Korea. North Korea, China. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, yeah, North Korea has got pretty good capability too, don't they? Right. And right. they are also known for their uh, uh, wipers. And it was, it, wow. it was, a, it was uh, actually Kaspersky, the cybersecurity, the antivirus company, actually came and uh, actually attributed the attack uh, they found uh, to North Korea. Um, and afterwards, uh, we and Kaspersky analyzed the, the files that led to this attack, and we found that um, in 99% uh, uh, this is actually not, not North Korea, and all the flags that led to North Korea were actually false flags. And the group behind this attack is a Russian private group dubbed Hedes which is, has nothing to do with nation state attacks, but usually associated with cyber crime attacks. And we have only, uh, we are, we have only uh, one question, who would uh, actually recruit this private hacking group to carry this attack with no financial, uh, uh, with no financial incentive? And we have no answer, but obviously this is some other nation state um, and see what happened. What happened that no one, no one actually answers at first at the, at the first chance, South Korea, well, but because always Sochi, what, Russia. But I don't understand the connection there. So they wiped a bunch of information. Did they wipe specifically the South Korean? Is that what you mean? They 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 wiped. No, what they did, they wiped servers in a major international event like the Winter Olympic Games, and they they, they did. Uh, uh, an enormous sabotage. Uh, they right. actually ruined the experience of the Winter Olympic Games back then in 2018. It was so powerful that people called it Olympic Destroyer, which is obviously a horrible name. Right. Uh, and the fact that afterwards no one answers that the Olympic Games, the previous Olympic Games were actually in North Korea, but everyone think Things that it was in Sochi that was actually eight years ago. So we had four years to um, to embrace that the previous Olympic Games were actually not not South Korea, but maybe this cyber attack was actually uh, the reason why everyone actually answers uh, um, Sochi, Russia. Man. I hope now everyone will remember it. It was in uh, Beijing. <laughs> I know. So, so this 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 attack on the Olympic, uh, the International Olympic Committee servers, was it done back in 2018 or recently yeah. that wiped it? No, okay. Back in 2018. So right, but... Oh, so right afterwards, ah, yeah. to kind of wipe the memory of it, right? To get right. rid of the 
Yeah. Wow. So obviously it was North Korea, right? I mean, no one else has the motivation to do this, but maybe why? What, I, what? I have all kinds of other suggestions. Uh, I don't know if a uh, live stream on uh, YouTube or right, is the we'll place save, to we'll share We'll save them. our careers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save our careers for private chat. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and exactly. We don't want to speculate when we speculate, right? We don't know yet. We'll keep researching. We'll find the answer, I'm sure. All right, my friend. Well, this is great. So I want to start digging into this security report. Yeah, we've got time. This is great because those two stories were just fantastic. So here we are, the 2022 security report. You deserve the best security. Okay. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is a freely available. Just go to checkpoint.com. You'll find it. And um, so let's uh, let's get started, man. So firstly, tell me, what, what was your involvement in this? Are you the guy that was compiling it or, how, how, you know, tell me in general terms about the report, how it hit your desk, what you do with it, who the researchers are, how we get it to market. OK, so for years, uh, actually for uh, five years, I actually was the one responsible for actually writing this report. Uh, but now uh, we have uh, many people involved. Uh, actually, uh, in this report, we have uh, four people invested for uh, uh, two and a half months, um, totally invested in this report. Um, but the data is collected and digested throughout the year, and we do it every six months, uh, just the same. So it actually consumes a lot of uh, efforts from us. Uh, I'm responsible to make sure that it actually fits uh, uh, the threat landscape, that the data uh, is not biased. Uh, what we do is always improve our data um, and think about the trend to see how we frame uh, all the events that we have seen and trying to forecast and uh, actually predict what would be the trend for the next six months. Um, so I'm actually managing the people who do that, but there are many people involved. And afterwards, after the two and a half months, there are people uh, uh, also that are trying to see uh, how to uh, fit uh, our product line into the evolving track landscape. So it right. is a constant walk. It actually impacts everything uh, in our uh, roadmap okay beautiful so the past well, i just clicked on something the past 12 months represents one of the most turbulent and disruptive periods in record it's right these gen 5 attacks just keep coming left right and center there's a beautiful introduction by our vice president of research maya horowitz and i hope you listen to so maya's got some great keynotes everybody you've got to go onto our youtube channel so go yeah, to checkpoints youtube great. channel and what was the what was the title of the one she did this year just recently a few weeks ago had a had a hack like a witch Hacking like a white hat, hat. A white hat witch. witch. Yeah, 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 hacking like a white hat witch. Exactly. All right, epic. So it was really good. Okay, so timeline. Let's just start here. Um, we're calling these an unusually high number of attacks, and it is unusually high, but every year is high. I right. mean, you know, so it's it's like, yeah. So I, I think that the sentence I would want customers to know is, or rather, this is interesting. Because I think a lot of people looking at this report actually need to, to take this report and put it on the CEO's desk and the CFO's desk. The CISO is the CISO is going to get great education from this. But you can use this document as a document to help educate your executive, your senior management. And so I would I would kind of say a sentence here. It's like absolutely right. It's an unusually high number, and every year it keeps increasing. So there's an increasingly beautiful, an increasingly high number of uh, of attacks that lead to disruptions of our day to day lives, including physical security, right, and including the sense of physical security that people have. All right. Yeah. Just to just to try and, and give some numbers to what you said, that we always yeah. see an increase in attacks, and it's right because cyber is uh, a more and more popular medium um, to monetize crime, uh, to carry to carry out uh, uh, interests um, and and such. And just to stress um, the the increase. So, for example, we all ask ourselves. Uh, ourselves, for example, how come ransomware were so powerful, became so powerful? And the answer is actually not in ransomware, but actually in some relatively uh, uh, not that interesting threat like botnets. Um, botnets are actually the engine behind ran ransomware. They're actually the stimulators. They are 
facilitating the blossom of ransomware because what they do botnets they infect a lot of uh, uh, they actually gain infection base which is large enough and what they do is actually resell this infection base to some other trade actors and many times they are actually ransomware gangs and the ransomware gangs don't in, uh, don't invest much in um in exploiting a specific company, but what they do, they actually purchase a uh, foothold in these companies. Uh, so for example, botnets that facilitated this blossom in uh, botnet infections actually increased by 30%. So if in 2020, we saw one out of every three companies is infected, actively infected with uh, uh, botnets, we are, we are seeing that in, uh, um, in 2021, out of every 2.5 um, uh, companies is infected with ransomware, is, and it means that we are talking about um, increase of um, of 30% in infections, and it's a lot. Infrastealers that are responsible for uh, for stealing credentials to uh, Office 365, for example, or to bank accounts or to uh, our sales force or whatever it is, actually mm. the, the, the infrastructure's infections increased in 50, by 50% and mobile 35%. So we're talking about a uh, significant increase in 2021 over 2020. Uh, and we, we expect this movement, this trend to actually continue into 2020. And these are numbers. It's it is not it's not marketing. It's nothing that can be right. manipulated. The numbers tell the story, and this is the story. We see increase of tens of percents in uh, uh, infections out there. Uh, mm. And while we are talking about these uh, large numbers, we need to remember that ransomware generate a lot of uh, attention. And we are talking with that. We're talking of, uh, in 2021 that one out of every 10 companies experienced um, um, an attempt to uh, to, to an, an attack attempt to uh, of ransomware. It is it's it's huge. We are talking about a targeted attack. Usually the, the numbers are much smaller, but one out of 10 companies is subject to targeted attack of ransomware. It's uh, something that uh, uh, we couldn't imagine back then in 2018, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I want to define botnets um, for the audience, um, but also with the info stealers. It's kind of interesting because surely the botnet is the foundation for everything. As you say, the botnet people, they, and isn't it amazing how the criminal syndicates have separated themselves into their own disciplines? One group are doing right. botnets now, another group, oh, we really like doing ransomware. We're just going to stick with this and we're going to, and it's so profitable, we're going to pay the botnet criminals for their information, right? So, so surely a botnet is necessary for an info stealer or is that, or is an info stealer a specific piece of code? You tell me about that because I keep hearing the okay. term info stealer, but I'm struggling cool. to identify what that might be. Yeah, sure. So first of all, yeah, there are different types of uh, uh, cyber gangs that are expert with uh, different expertise. Yeah. Um, while we we think that ransomware is the uh, high end uh, malware uh, and there is nothing more uh, advanced than that, uh, botnets can be very sophisticated. Let's take, for example, uh, Emotet. Emotet is one of the notorious uh, uh, botnets ever right. made. Um, and in January uh, 27, I think, uh, 2021, um, it was a global effort of eight countries, including the uh, Europol, that took down Emotet. Um, and it was so, uh, it was a complete operation of many countries and, and law enforcement to take down one botnet that actually facilitated the blossom of ransomware. Um, and, on, and 10 months later, Emotet got back. Really? So yeah. eight countries invested a lot of money to take down one of the most successful uh, botnets. And it took it something like 10 months to gain confidence back again and do a comeback. And how did it, how did it actually uh, did 
the uh, uh, comeback by some uh, with the uh, assistant of some other botnet, Trickbot. So they really? assist each other in gaining the the Kuto. Why? Because they even collaborate between each other. So one botnet drops yeah. the, uh, some other botnet that, for example, is uh, specializing in uh, it specializes in after getting a Kuto in the company, they want not to infect one computer in the company, but tens of computers in the company. So they need another one to do the lateral, lateral movement and, uh, um, and enlarge the infection base within the company. And this specific uh, uh, botnet also needs to tell what company they actually infected. So they will be able to sell it to some other uh, threat actor. They cannot sell a computer, but they sell actually all in a company. So they would have to say what is the domain and what is the company and what is, for example, uh, the financial reports of the company and what they are able to pay uh, if you are actually uh, uh, um, able to encrypt the data and ask for ransom. So would you gain something like $10 million or $5 million? It's important. Um, so it also affects the, 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 the price of the foothold. Uh, so it's a world business. Uh, botnets, this is uh, uh, their job. Info stealers, info stealers actually, it's quite different. Uh, what they do, they, for example, uh, I check your browser, browser, so they are able to tell if you are browsing into your uh, uh, bank account, and if you are browsing into your bank account, you will be shown with some other page that you would think that uh, you are uh, on your uh, bank bank website, but actually you are on some other uh, website, and you are not you are not aware of it. Um, they still they steal all kind of passwords that you store on your browser. Right. Uh, they look for wallets uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies that you have on your computer. So it is some other um, some other expertise that uh, they have to uh, to develop. Um, so they are different. Um, they are different type of malware, uh, different different type of uh, cyber games. Yeah, I, I heard the term for the first time the other day. Um, actually, just after our acquisition um, uh, for uh, uh, what, what do they call this, this term? They saw uh, scanning for secrets. That's right. right. Scanning right. for secrets now, and I'm like, oh, you know, this is definitely a DevSecOps type of um, um, terminology. So, and I don't normally talk to those guys, but it's like they've been scanning for secrets for a while, these folks. So, okay, so botnets, when a group of an organization puts a botnet together, essentially they have strung a bunch, tell me if I'm right in this, they've strung a bunch of servers together around the world. All of those servers are running a particular command, and that is to look for vulnerabilities across the web of any company. They don't care, I'm sure. They're not, you know, they don't discriminate at all. Obviously, they want a big hit, so if they can get a big company, that's more valuable to them. And then they sell that data to ransomware threat actors. Do the botnet folks, are they, are they doing anything besides selling a, a, a key to the door to these corporations? Are they themselves sabotaging the corporation or are they just selling the key? So they are just selling the key, but they are also uh, able to assist with deploying the ransomware, for example, inside the, the company. Um, and you also need to remember that the, 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 the weak point is actually us, the users. So what the info stealers gangs also, but also the button gangs, what they do, they actually invest much in uh, phishing campaigns um, and trying to lure you into downloading specific uh, 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 malware into your uh, device. So they are also heavily invested in uh, crafting and designing the attack so you uh, won't uh, notice that um, they are attacking you. Uh, we see many campaigns, different types, different type of campaigns. We saw, for example, it was, I think, Qbot that used uh, Windows 10 applications. Uh, you couldn't uh, tell that someone is trying to infect you with uh, Windows 10 applications. Right. Um, there were um, all kinds of other things like uh, Christmas and uh, Valentine's, and there are many types of uh, campaigns. And exactly. They are effective. And, and your point on your your opening sentence here about um, you know there being uh, you know one of the most uh, disruptive periods on record. Here we are. I mean, look at these logos right out the gate. Solar Winds. 
obviously Office 365 and, and wow. Windows 10, you're talking about this right now. Um, I just got a little close. This is a little small for the screen there. Um, <laughs> Department of Justice, yeah, obviously getting involved in the uh, the FBI. Um, and who's that one? That's another Department of Justice. So Spotify, uh, I don't remember this one. What was the Spotify hit? Uh, credential stuffing. Tell us what right. credential stuffing is, please, Lotum. Uh, okay, so there are all kinds of, uh, of info-stealing attacks and uh, hijacking attacks. And what actually hackers uh, do is uh, they, do all, they, they try everything uh, into, uh, to uh, actually um, hijack your accounts, whether it is to uh, brute force uh, password, whether it is to steal to steal all kind of, they actually, what they do is they uh, buy uh, from access brokers on the darknet uh, credentials to different uh, accounts. And we and what they know is actually that they reuse, uh, or that we reuse uh, passwords and usernames. And what they do is actually trying to, uh, uh, to uh, hijack different accounts on different applications with the same databases that they purchase um, and there are every time new databases there are every time new uh, um, bridges that actually fuel this market of access uh, brokers um, and spotify was just like that uh, with a lot of uh, uh, passwords that actually leaked and um, uh, used to hijack accounts. In there. And so they've written a program, a script that basically says, take these email addresses as usernames and take these passwords and apply it to everything. Spotify, right. Google, doesn't matter, right? right. The script runs right. and then all of a sudden some accounts will authenticate. They probably go into a bucket somewhere that they then exploit. Other accounts don't authenticate. Some accounts, like you and me, are multi-factor. <laughs> so right. we're just going to get temporarily locked out of our account. And, and that brings an interesting point, doesn't it? We'll get temporarily locked out of our account. That means nothing to the threat actor. So it, it, I love this sentence. There is zero cost for a threat actor being wrong. This is what CFOs and CEOs need to understand is on the weight of, of the shoulders of the CISO, right? There's no cost to a threat actor being wrong. You know, they, they, they try an attempt, nothing happens. It's just a little bit of power and a few keystrokes. Whereas there is a massive penalty for the CISO being wrong once, <laughs> right? So we can't afford to be wrong once. They can afford to be wrong as many times as they like. It's an it's an unfair advantage. I simply like to point out. So that so then Spotify was um, so so this attack. Spotify was hit by credential stuff, uh, stuffing. Also, Spotify, the corporation, right? They they actually right. somehow successfully attacked this one here. Um, and actually, are you familiar a little bit more with this Spotify one? Um, what uh, I, I quite I don't remember now the details in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can I can quickly uh, I can check quickly. No, it's okay. Um, that's okay. Because look, it says here, you know, working in the fraudulent database taken down by the internet service provider to Spotify's own security is not linked to a breach in Spotify's security. Cyber criminals carrying out credential stuffing exploit. Um, they exploit people who reuse the same password, just like you said. Okay. How interesting. This is what this is Microsoft's new uh, symbol, isn't it? Who's this? This is the, uh, yeah, Microsoft Exchange server vulnerabilities. Right. All right. There's a, there's a lot so of it took the world the world the world by storm actually um in general i think that solar winds opened the door for uh, um actually um solar winds made us security experts i the incident response experts uh -huh. uh, and the researchers actually to investigate networks heavily and <clears throat> to look for uh, any suspicious activity um, to understand better uh, our uh, um, actually major software and applications in the organizations like Exchange Service, like SolarWinds Service, because um, it caught us actually uh, uh, very surprised uh, in a way the uh, SolarWind uh, the, so the, um, the SolarWinds uh, actually uh, act um, and what. What we did actually that we analyzed many networks, not only us, but 
other searches. And we found that there are major threats, major uh, uh, vulnerabilities in uh, very important applications. And one of them is obviously uh, the Microsoft Exchange, and it mm. was February, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, February... Uh, uh, March 2nd, 21. March, March 2nd, yeah. yeah. Uh, March 2nd, when uh, an, a critical vulnerability in uh, Office that allowed any uh, attacker to actually uh, connect through the, uh, the open web interface of uh, the Exchange, uh, of um, wow. exchange service to the server and from there on to run uh, arbitrary code on um, any uh, network that uses uh, exchange service of any version uh, earlier to uh, that earlier to March uh, 2021 um, and this actually was quickly implemented and integrated in the arsenal of advanced threat actors who were actually actively exploiting this vulnerability uh, very quickly um, at the beginning of 2021. Um, and it required a lot of uh, efforts from our side to see who is compromised, who is still vulnerable, uh, how to uh, mitigate it quickly, how to allow virtual patching to, to those who cannot update their exchange servers or not, not aware of um, the OA, the open, um, web interface of right. uh, of, ex of the exchanges. So actually uh, admins, uh, security admins and network admins are not fully aware of all the devices, all the servers, all the nodes in the so. network and they need assistance in mitigating such an attack. It end This year ended with log4j, last year ended with log4j mm -hmm. and this right. actually proved everyone that we cannot tell if the application is vulnerable or not, or whether we're using vulnerable application and where, whether we are exposing uh, a certain app to the internet. Um, and it was quite a mess. And we as security company, as security experts need... Oh, you froze there, Lotum, all of a sudden. I don't know if you can hear me on your balcony. You've frozen a little bit. There you go, you got, yeah. I got you back. Yeah. Just a bit of bandwidth. You got issue. me back, sorry, yeah. um, sorry for good. that. Okay. So I, what I mean that Log4j proved that we need, uh, that it is difficult to mitigate the network, especially when it is mm. uh, big enough. Um, and we as security experts, we actually are here to provide virtual patching alternatives right. to uh, patching that is very costly and sometimes, imp sometimes impossible like in Log4j. And this is what we do. And this is what we did in, with Log4j, for example, that right away, on the same day, we provided protection in different platforms just to uh, allow you to be protected, even if you are not familiar with applications and the bits and bytes of them, if they're using Log4j or not, if it is Java or not, uh, we are okay. here to allow you. That's really cool. And that is a whole episode in and of itself, isn't it? What we were managed yeah. to accomplish there. Who should I get on the uh, on the show to talk about that at checkpoint? Who should I chat with? You probably, right? <laughs> okay, sure. I'm bringing I'm you back. I'm here to, to tell the entire story, and we have a bunch of people in CPR who are actually mm -hmm. responsible for developing this content, these protections, and they are obviously uh, will be here with me uh, to discuss the the lesson. Learned. I want to, no, that's what I want to talk about. Okay, so let's do this because I, I had somebody text me about 10 minutes ago and say that LinkedIn is not allowing, or it's not that it's not allowing, it's broken. The comments aren't coming through. So apparently people are trying to engage, but I'm so sorry for those listening live. Um, I've got it streaming on my phone. There's 46 people. So my apologies. One person has managed to jump in over uh, YouTube. So thank you for doing that. And uh, Him Manchu, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm going to take a guess that you might be from uh, either our India office or one of our customers over there or somewhere in that direction. Thank you for tuning in, though, also over uh, YouTube. Apologies. Um, I use a piece of software called StreamYard to, 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 to stream this into the, uh, the LinkedIn channel. And uh, for some reason, it's broken. Maybe something to do with me being black and white like a ghost. So let's do this then, Lotum. So for those people, they may well, the comments might appear in the archive. So I'll jump, my commitment is I'll jump back into the archive and I will respond to comments. I'll answer your questions and I'll take good care of you, okay? 
my next commitment is to bring Lotan back to discuss exactly that, what we did as a response to Log4j. It was brilliant. So um, ah, another one. Okay, beautiful. Thanks for dialing in over YouTube, everybody. This is cool, Thank right? You. This is why we've got redundancy in platforms. Okay, so Tony, thanks for dialing in as well. Um, we're going to carry on the conversation about the security report this coming Thursday with another guest. And so it'll be Thursday at 12 noon Eastern. 12 noon Eastern, and we hope to catch most of the tail end of the day folks in uh, Europe and Africa and uh, catch the Pacific group. And then for those who might dial in uh, from India at this time of day, I don't know what time it is for you. Thank you for your commitment. All right, Lotum, I'm going to thank you there. I'd like to bring you back on the security report as well. Maybe in a month or two, we'll chat with some other guests. We'll bring you back in. We'll see if we can get to another page. <laughs> this is a pretty detailed <laughs> report, right? We only got to like page three or something after all of the uh, the opening credits, as it were. And again, ladies and gentlemen, you can find this report on Checkpoint.com. So go to Checkpoint, download this report for free. Lotum, the team, we're going to keep walking through this every week until we've exhausted every little piece of information. And as you can see, when I get guests like Lotum on the phone, it's like, wow, there are so many stories. There's so much to learn. And already I want to take us in the direction of what we did for Log4j because that was a brilliant response. Okay, man, stay right there because I want to say goodbye. I'm going to kick us out to the green room so we can talk. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Lotum. Thank you very much. Thank you All very right. much.